Hello, you big, beautiful brains out there. Today, we're talking about different types of psychological studies. Before we get started, take a minute and subscribe to Psy vs. Psy. Help out your friendly neighborhood psychologist while I tell you all about different types of research studies. The first kind is called naturalistic observation. That sounds really big and complicated, so let's break it down. Observation means to observe something, to watch it, and record what happens. Naturalistic in this setting just means naturally. So something or someone would naturally do. Naturalistic observation just means watching what something does when it's just behaving like it naturally would. We can actually get a lot of information just by watching and recording what goes on. Naturalistic observation is especially great because this type of study is done out in the real world. That's why you'll see them a lot in biology or in business studies, both areas where they need to find out how people and animals operate in their natural setting. Biologist Jane Goodall used naturalistic observation when she studied chimps in Tanzania. Business majors will use this all the time when you're looking at consumer buying behavior. This is probably the cheapest kind of study you can do. Usually, it only involves the researcher and maybe a computer or phone for keeping track of the data. There is a pretty big downside to naturalistic observation, however, and it's that every researcher carries pre-existing biases that can obscure what they're actually observing. When this happens, we call it observer bias. And the best way to overcome it is to make sure you have more than one other person also watching the data that you find out in the real world. Even though they'll have their own pre-existing biases, the more eyes you can get on the data, the greater the chance that you'll get a true unbiased reflection of what's really going on. The second type of study we're gonna talk about is a case study. Case studies are up close, in-depth studies of one particular case. The case can be a particular group or a situation or an individual, but usually there's something highly unique and special about that case because these types of really in-depth studies are costly and time-consuming. Oftentimes in psychology, Case studies look at individuals who are under specific biological, behavioral, or developmental conditions that would be unethical to inflict upon another individual. For instance, the case study of a railroad construction worker from the 1800s named Phineas Gage. He suffered an accident where a large iron rod went through his left frontal lobe, basically destroying that part of his brain. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be ethical to give somebody brain damage just for the sake of a research study. But if someone already has that type of condition and they're willing to participate in the study, the information you can learn through a detailed case study can be incredibly helpful to the study of the brain and behavior. Another thing to remember about case studies is that just because the information is so specific to that case and individual, it can be hard to generalize that information to a wider population. The third type of study we're going to talk about, and probably the one that you're most familiar with, is a survey. Most of us have taken surveys, whether they were customer satisfaction surveys, like rating an app or a game, or market surveys for things like TV viewing habits from places like Nielsen, or even just like BuzzFeed surveys about what kind of muscle car you'd be based on your choice of cupcakes. <laughs> surveys ask people questions and just record how they respond. And they can be pretty useful. For starters, they get you lots of information really quick. Also, they're pretty cheap and usually pretty easy to put together. But surveys come with a massive downside. So think about a survey you've taken, any survey, doesn't matter from where. Now, on that survey, did you answer every question completely honestly? Yeah, it's a huge problem. People are not always accurate. Maybe they didn't understand the question, or maybe they might not want the researcher to know how they feel. The problem gets even worse 
when you start offering cash or prizes for completing the survey. You can pretty much get all the positive responses you want if you give people enough cash or cool stuff. <laughs> so next time you see a survey that sounds a little off, make sure you keep that in mind. Another type of study that actually doesn't involve you collecting any data at all is our fourth kind. It's called archival research. And instead of going out and collecting brand new data, you look at old records and try to make sense of patterns from history. So say you're interested in engineering. You might want to look at data samples from a lot of different papers that look at the performance of one kind of fuel. Or if you're interested in land resources or agriculture, you might want to explore the performance of a certain type of soil cultivation and compare it to records of crop cultivation. There's actually a whole field that does that. It's called agronomy. You use other people's data to try to make new connections when you're doing archival research. But archival research also has a downside, and that's that sometimes the information that you need just isn't there. Not everything has always been written down, and that can leave you with pretty big gaps in whatever it is that you're trying to explore. So, just because it's been a long time, though, doesn't necessarily mean that it's an archival study. It could be our fifth kind. Could be a longitudinal research study. So, if you're reading a study and they've been collecting that same data for a really long time, chances are you're looking at longitudinal research. So say you want to be a teacher. You might read a study where they've been collecting test scores for fifth graders for the past 30 years and then mapping how many of them graduate university. Longitudinal studies are just that. They're really long. And their biggest downside is that they can take decades before that information is available. If you're a teacher and you want to know how many fifth graders are graduating, you would have to wait 30 years before that study was over. Also, there's a huge amount of pressure on researchers at universities to publish studies fast. And this type of study doesn't feed into that model for a quick publication turnaround. So longitudinal studies also have other problems like huge rates of attrition, that's participant dropout, because they take so long. Another thing is that it can be really hard to prove their usefulness. The world moves really fast these days, and probably the fifth graders from 30 years ago are under entirely different pressures from fifth graders right now. So, if you want to find out more about why research is so important, especially in psychology, check out this video from Sci vs. Sci. Or if you want to watch our latest video, click right over here. Make sure you like, subscribe, and do all those fun YouTube-y things. And until next time, keep thinking, and I'll see y'all later. Bye.